The following feature is intended for mature audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Michael Lowry. Nikki Wagner. Steve Fisher, Rich Green, Daniel French, Paul Green Dennis, J.V. Torres, Logan Smith, Sean Grimes, Rhiannon McAfee, Nikki Lutz, Wesley Critchfield, Aaron Johnson, Jerry Elif, Gwendolyn Lim, and James C. Taylor. Into the Zapper by Conway Fitzgerald. Part One. Have you ever been down there? You ever caught a whiff of one of those fucking reclamation areas? Hmm? <laughs> I mean, the stench. Of the raw filth that's just baked into the concrete. It's that unmistakable reek of human remains, you know? You ever smelt that? Harvey asked dismissively, motioning his hand towards his nose. Can't say that I have. The corporate officer replied. I mean, it's always there. But you only get a real good whiff of it when you demask. When you try to eat or maybe have a smoke. It's that god-awful smell of human waste. Of just wasted humans. Harvey finished in a near whisper. The officer seemed unmoved by his description. The work of all of our movers, everything you've all done thus far, has been outstanding. The department is still ahead of schedule. We've been quite pleased with your employment history to date, Mr. Mangan. We understand it is not a pleasant experience. Not a pleasant experience? <laughs> Harvey scoffed at his choice of words. I, I remember when it still bothered me. You know, I would get upset with myself that I, I still smelled it at all. I mean, just pissed off at my own nose for not having just gotten used to that constant stench, you know? Like when you're a cattle farmer or raising fucking goats, you know, you just stop smelling the shit after a while, don't you? Harvey said. The man nodded back. I know. I never really stopped smelling it. Harvey admitted. That's why your kit is equipped with respiration and hydrofiltration systems, Mr. Mangan. You shouldn't ever expose yourself to the toxic elements within the reclamation areas. It's quite unhealthy. That's what the mask is for. This has all been covered in your training. The officer insisted. He reviewed Harvey's employment file on his personal digipad. The reason we brought you here today, Mr. Mankin, is because evidently, according to this report, yesterday afternoon you left a post-judgment standby CD7-831-079 unattended prior to final vaporization right outside of suite a-17. This report affirms you walked away, leaving PJS there, prior to final delivery. The officer presented Harvey with an image of the person's face on his digipad. Why would you do this? Well, I don't look at their fucking faces, pal. I delivered my standby just like I always do. Harvey waved off the ID photo. It's those fucking... Retarded clerks and jerk-offs from Pharma trying to blame everything on us movers, as usual. That's what this is. They must have fucked up. Harvey insisted authoritatively. The corporate officer frowned with disagreement as he reviewed the footage of the incident once again. At 1647.51, you can be seen walking away from the assigned gurney of the subject. You then exit the doorway to the emergency stairwell 11. Your pass card was used to unlock the door. The officer thought he had pinned him, but Harvey did not relent. Sure, I take the stairwells down sometimes. There's no rule against that. You think I enjoy riding on elevators with standbys? You ever done that before? 
Harvey huffed at him. I checked that standby in with the clerk. Harvey insisted. What what happened? Was there another wake-up? Harvey smiled, asking innocently. Indeed. It was quite an unfortunate incident. The officer said bitterly. No one could account for the mover responsible for delivery. Come to find out, it was you, the officer accused. Harvey smiled and attempted to change the subject. Oh, the worst is when they wake up. It's usually right before delivery just as they've entered the A-wing. It's like freaking clockwork. So those cocksuckers in pharma, they, they know just how long those drugs are gonna last and they're such cheap pricks. You know, they minimize the dosage and we movers get to deal with all the consequences. Fuck. At least keep them down until it's over, for Christ's sake. Harvey said angrily. The corporate officer looked shocked by this sentiment. After an uncomfortable silence, Harvey continued. Last week we had one guy wake up just outside the double doors to A-17. I mean, literally, next in fucking line. Guy pops up suddenly like he just Realized he left his digi wallet on the orb. Everything he owns, you know, all his ID, his crypto keys, lost forever. Eyes wide open, breathing heavy. Now it doesn't take him long to realize where he is and what's next. You know, he sees all the others laying there in line. So he hops off the gurney and he's screaming now. Harvey smiled as he remembered how the incident began. The officer seemed dubious of his story. Yeah. Harvey nodded at him, assuredly. His smile then evolved into a scowl. We had a fucking standby, running naked down the hall. Took three of us to get him to the ground. He's screaming his guts out now, so we're all sure any second another one's gonna wake up, right? Phillips is helping me, trying to get the pacifier in his mouth to shut him up, and the fucking guy's biting his hands like a rabid dog, and then that fat-ass Monica from the emergency pharmacy station over at Hall B. Yeah, yeah, she she comes over waddling her sweet little ass, taking her time while we're fighting with this grown man who knows he's gonna die today. He's using all his remaining strength. He's heaving under us, moaning for mercy. His whole life's future depends on his will to break free from us holding him down. And then fucking Monica, she's complaining about how much he's moving. Like she can't give him the shot. You fucking kidding me? She finally gives him the goddamn midazolam, and then the guy pukes and shits and pisses all over the floor. <sighs> now, before we can put him back on the gurney, Monica says she needs to fill out some further data or some shit on her digipad. What the fuck? I mean, it's not enough we gotta carry this shit-covered standby onto the gurney and then wheel his ass over to the zapper? No, no, no. Now we have to wrestle with him first. It's like a daily fucking cage match. Fuck that. You know, some of these people on the inside are as lazy and useless as the ones we zap. You want to know what happened to that standby? There's your fucking answer. We deal with that shit on a daily basis, pal. Harvey said boldly and defiantly. An alert rang on the officer's digipad. He read the message and then looked back to Harvey. You'll have to excuse me, Mr. Mankin. The officer said, leaving the room suddenly. Okay, so I can leave now? Hey, what's, what's going on here? Harvey demanded of the officer. The corporate officer ignored his throated pleas and left quickly without another word. The heavy door shut behind him tightly and then locked electronically. Part 2 Harvey Mankin was born in Brooklyn, New York on November 7th, 1999. The son of a firefighter, Thomas, and Eileen, a paramedic who later became an RN. The young couple enjoyed a hard-working but happy life in Bay Ridge with their infant son until September 11th, 2001. On that fateful day, Harvey's father was lost attempting to evacuate the World Trade Center's North Tower as it fell. The widowed Eileen was left to raise Harvey on her own, which she did, until Harvey left home at 17 to become a proud member of the United States Marine Corps. Harvey served honorably, including two combat tours in Afghanistan between 
2018 to 2021. Despite Harvey's best efforts and all the human suffering he witnessed, the mighty United States military was forced, like every empire before it, to accept the land's inevitable forfeiture. For all its perceived moral high ground and best intentions, the United States was served its share of national ignominy. It was a simple geopolitical equation. Kabul was no longer worth the expense. Harvey and his expeditionary unit were made to leave the wrecked nation in chaos. There was no other way it could be done. Afghanistan had become a land and people barren of any further purpose or consequence to American interests. Harvey had made many deep spiritual friendships among the Pashtun he campaigned with, allied tribesmen and interpreters, intelligence ops and others who risked everything for their shot at democracy. As the Taliban closed in on Bagram, Harvey's squad boarded a C-9 Skytrain and left that place forever. His phone then filled with texts and calls of desperation. Harvey appealed to every source of military authority, but eventually he had to block his phone to find any semblance of peace. The electronic door buzzed and then opened forcefully. Harvey rose from his seat. It was Bureau Chief Collins. He held out his hand, suggesting Harvey remain seated as he looked upon him with surprise. He then turned his head to the other side of the thick wooden door to say something unheard to someone unseen. He then entered the room fully and the heavy door closed and locked behind him. Mankin, what are you doing here? Asked the big boss. I don't know, something about a bad wake up of a standby I delivered. I told the guy it must have been- Harve! The boss had grown impatient with his deflections his eyes were ablaze with disappointment. I've got a pair of closers waiting right outside that door, he threatened. Closers were what the body corporate called the prosecutors of their private courts, the advocates for the legal disposal of indigent people. The closers were the guys that bought you your ticket to suite A-17. Now before they come in and begin their work, is there anything you want to tell me? The chief demanded. What do you want to know, chief? Harvey shook his head as he spoke, maintaining an air of coy innocence. This only angered Collins more. Dahlia Preston, he said, showing Harvey the young woman's picture on his digipad. It was a lovely young black woman. Her head was completely hairless in preparation for sweet A-17. Her eyes were closed. Where is she? One week earlier. So now I'm on my way home. Been working 14 hour shifts for three straight days, said Torres. He, Harvey, and another mover named Ingram commiserated in a newly opened bar of the Lower East Side Reclamation Zone. They listen to their co-worker's story intently. And as I'm waiting for the Cross River Orb, I notice this old bag looking at me. Huh, she's staring me down. Got this cold, angry look on her face. Her eyes fixed on my DUR badge, like she knows what I've been doing all day. And not only is she not grateful for what I've dealt with for these many long hours. No, now I have some worthless old broad giving me shade about doing my job. I mean, what we do for these fuckers? They only knew, answered Harvey as he took another sip of his whiskey. But she's all looking at me like, oh, Department of Urban Recovery, D-U-R. <laughs> yeah, I know what you're up to with this real scolding, you're a despicable man kind of look. <laughs> Torres pursed his lips tightly together. His eyes squinted. The other two movers burst into laughter as Torres imitated an old, raspy, contentious voice. She said that? Asked Ingram. Nah, 
But I knew what she was thinking. It was obvious, Torres assured him. I had to stop myself. I wanted to tell that miserable broad what's what. <laughs> or better yet, maybe make a few calls and have the fucking closers investigate her ass right then and there. Harvey laughed, <laughs> and then Ingram, the other fellow mover, motioned for Torres to keep it down. But he continued his story unabated. This sort of drunken confession was the only therapy these movers could get. No one could ever know what they really do. Yeah, let's bring you into the C block. See what you're offering the world, you judgmental bitch. But no, I can't do that. We have a code of conduct. Not like these scumbags we have to clear. No code for life at all. No fucking reason to even be breathing. And they wonder why they all get removed. Torres finished as the door to the bar burst open and two young couples entered. These were the brand new arrivals to the neighborhood. The new young urban professionals that had been cleared to repopulate this freshly reclaimed urban border area. Do you have any champagne? Asked one of the young women quite loudly. It's for my friend. She's getting married. The heavily made up girls laughed as they approached the bartender. <laughs> the bartender said. The two girls, already quite inebriated, didn't understand him. <laughs> what? I don't think I know that brand. Is it local? One said with heavy condescension. The other burst into laughter soon after, imitating the bartender's perceived mumble. No cash. Digital currency only. The bartender spoke up. Oh, of course. Like I'm going to give you dollars. The girls once again laughed with contemptuous condescension. It was inevitable, wasn't it? As soon as we clean up the city and remove the scum off the streets, then of course, all the rich fucks come back and act like they fucking own the place. Javi said out loud, loud enough for the two drunken yuppies to overhear. His intention was clearly for that to happen. Look at him. He's so happy. Everything's so clean. They can finally spend some of their daddy's money in the big city. No. They don't have to endure the junkies shooting up on every street corner, the psychos robbing them at gunpoint. Harvey said angrily. Once again, Ingram tried to play the voice of reason, his open palms waving downward, suggesting Harvey keep it down. Yeah, whatever, losers. Oh! <laughs> the girls turned away from Harvey's shadowy voice and then retreated to the front of the bar where their boyfriends had camped. Whoa! You hear that, Ingram? <laughs> she says you're a loser. You're a fucking loser, Ingram! <laughs> Yo, fuck you, man! <laughs> Harvey was satisfied to commit the rest of his rant to his own thoughts while staring down the newcomers angrily. Why do you think they're all gone now, sweetheart? Harvey's tindered rage descended deeper into his subconscious, numbing all his senses of the outer world. It's because of the work we do. The work fucks like you never see. Harvey yelled internally at the lovely young woman. After a few minutes, a patrol orb from the newly minted Manhattan Sheriff's Office showed up right outside the bar. The green-horned cops were equipped with their own new orbs and shiny new uniforms. The two-man patrol carried a look of apprehension as they entered the bar. The boyfriends of the two young debutantes had summoned the police to quiet their girlfriend's resounding complaints. They didn't want to fight. They considered themselves far too important for that. After a brief exchange with the drunken women and their boyfriends, the two cops approached the movers. Right away, the new cops realized who they were. Hi there. You fellows D-U-R? One asked. How'd you figure that out? Dude, you're on your way to make a detective. 
said Torres. Yes, the word goes to. <laughs> the other two chuckled. Hey guys, we just started, okay? We're not looking for any trouble. The new cop looked back towards the young couples. We got a call. These kids got scared. Oh, well, maybe they should go home, said Harvey. The cop smiled at him, and then the two turned back towards the couples. Within a minute, they had all left the bar, despite the young woman's vocal protest. Being a mover for the DUR was like being a made man in the Mafia. No one could mess with you. Most New Yorkers, those living legally on the city's outskirts and within the cleared reclamation zones, had a vague idea of what was happening at DUR. They performed forcible evictions, the removal of indigent people and their things to a safer place for rehabilitation. But no one dared dream of what was really happening inside that corporate facility on Chambers Street. Just steps away from what was City Hall and the massive marble pillared buildings that were once home to what had been the American justice system. The fear of knowing how that sausage was really made. The not wanting to know. That's what kept DUR from unwanted scrutiny. If anyone dared investigate DUR, they'd likely find themselves under investigation. Harvey was now an officer within a next generation civic control corporation a CCC with full legal and even prosecutorial power. Harve, demanded the chief again. She had orders. She was post-judgment standby. That woman no longer exists, Harvey. That's a problem. That's a big fucking problem. His glaring eyes peered into Harvey's. Where did she go? I don't know, chief. Harvey said, disappointing his boss. Ah, then I can't help you. Collins frowned. The chief then grabbed his files and left without another word. Harvey then waited for hours locked inside that interrogation room, alone with his thoughts. Part 3 The Financial Crash of 2031 was what came to be known as the big one. When the curtain finally came down, the Wall Street hedge fund managers and crypto billionaires were first to realize it was over and escaped to their yachts and private islands. They abandoned their high-rise midtown condos, leaving what was left of the Big Apple behind, a rotted core. All the money was gone. The banks closed leaving an angry nation of consumption with only a dry trough to fight over. Eventually, the entire island of Manhattan was overrun by an endless horde of indigents seeking help. There were millions of them, people with nothing and nowhere left to go. They owned nothing but the stuff they clung to and wheeled around aimlessly. Throngs gathered, bringing further chaos and anarchy into the city with them. So many people, with nothing left to offer, only the hope to survive another day. Meanwhile, wars were being waged by the United States and its allies all over the world. The cost proved unsustainable. New York State became insolvent, and the federal government followed soon after. The defense budget evaporated. Within five years, there was no longer an organized American military to speak of. American democracy ceased when the nation could no longer afford to hold elections. Feudal zones and highway checkpoints manned by privately funded militia were all that remained. These security corporations became the new overlords of America. They were what held down those gated communities and saw to the establishment of commerce inside protected go zones. The NYPD disbanded by union vote when their salaries had defaulted for the third straight time. Fire departments, 
EMS, trash removal, hospitals. All essential city services could no longer afford to show up for duty. Everything municipal was then left unattended. Motorized gangs claimed Park Avenue. Some neighborhoods were claimed by angry armed residents who became the new warlords, blocking any way in or out. Those held up within the city could only hide themselves in fear and watch it all burn. The headstrong that chose to remain were accosted constantly. There was no escaping so many hungry and angry people. That was New York before Durbitz, just like every other abandoned American city in 2036. Harvey hated Durbitz at first. He seemed like all the others, another crackpot blowhard. He was a corpo politician who was simply talking some good game to line his own pockets. He'd get into office, then claim he couldn't do anything because of the opposition. He'd make himself and his friends rich, and then they'd all vanish. Politicians were all lying pieces of shit as far as Harvey was concerned. But this guy Durbitz wouldn't let up. Some of the things he and his Renew Corporation were proposing actually made some sense to Harvey. Within the Corpo state, there is no opposition, only a self-interested business strategy, structured for profit, and thereby, perhaps, for success. We must build a new foundation of working people who wish to contribute, to create, to build. We must stop trying to pay the poverty away, he would say. We need to preserve what good we have left, expand those small pockets of civilization, and rebuild our cities from there on out. House by house, street by street, section by section, reclamation zone by zone. Durbitz was appointed governor of New York by a cadre of corporate board members, promising the terrified masses a way out of this horrible mess. Durbitz promised to preserve hope for human civilization and a restoration of Harvey's beloved city. Harvey was listening. When Durbitz got into office in Albany in 2036, the first thing he did was form the Department of Urban Recovery. He didn't need the approval of state representatives or their bipartisan committees. He simply made backroom deals with the power brokers, and it happened. There were no longer any committees, courts, and judges, so there were no dissenting opinions to contend with, no lawyers or advocacy groups to be heard. Renew Corp and the internal blockchain asset holders would pay for the creation of the DUR out of pocket. Renew would fund all of the work, soup to nuts. From the sweeping of the people from the streets through their kangaroo courts, from the shit piles to the zapper. Of course, that's not what they proposed out loud. Their corporate media issued timed edicts and special announcements, broadcast only to their private intranet. At first, the DUR embarked on a simple clearing and relocation strategy. They created zones based on financial segregation. No one was allowed in or out of a zone without the approval of the DUR. The gang lords that resisted were wasted by Renew's private army. These were well-trained combat veterans who still had modern weaponry and the advantage of high-tech reconnaissance. They made quick work of any armed resistance. After the battles were over, DUR would move thousands of people to the city's outer borough zones and into reassessment centers. There, they'd offer the sobbing mothers some formula and diapers for the children. They'd offer the able-bodied a meal and maybe some booze. 
They'd even offer the crackheads their next fix just to get them to come along. Whatever they needed to be relocated. We're here to help. Just come with us, they would say, and be reassessed. The Urban Renewal Project was a three-step process. Removal, assessment, and then disposal. The stated goal was to assist disenfranchised people with a way to re-establish a home and a place of employment, with the goal of an eventual full repayment to the corpo state for their homes, jobs, and lives. In other words, this was an indentured loan process. It was a high-tech, 21st century sharecropping system. Harvey came to believe this was the only way forward. He convinced himself of this. No, Durbin said. We're not taxing the rich to pay for this shit. But fuck those useless scumbags. You pay renewal back for these programs, at interest. This benefits you, so you should pay for it. You're the people who need my company's help. We don't owe any of you anything. I thought it was brilliant. I was ruthless, but it was true and without politics. It was harsh, but also completely necessary. How is the deal he offered these people not fair? How is that not justice, given these impossible circumstances? The corporate state were the same people who own the plastic consumer economy. This was a clean reform of the same system, without the filter of corrupt government hands and political infighting. I was amazed when the DUR was first created. Because I knew Collins from the war, I was fast-tracked into service. I was a member of the very first class of movers. The trainers described the process of arrest, deportation, and demolition like it was a goddamn video game. And if you could pass the physical and psych prep test, you could earn excellent money and you were given a decent place to live within the secured gated buildings on Roosevelt Island. I was dying to leave the force long before it had become insolvent. Picking up squatters like trash off the street sounded like a perfect job for me. Fuck. Someone had to do it. But once the unwanted were corralled into the reassessment areas, the closers could weed out the troublesome ones. Anyone who still thought they had any old American rights left. Then they'd find the weakest, the sick, the elderly, those who were unlikely to pass the physical test. They'd send them to the special home, where no one would ever hear from them again. The children deemed fit for correction were sent to a 14 hours day trade and boarding school where they would learn the values of a hard day's work. Those schools taught the kids that they'd been relocated because their ignorant, lazy, and useless parents fucked them up, leaving them with nothing, teaching them nothing of value. The corporate state would teach them properly how to be a productive member of the new society, not an eternal recipient of the social largesse. Of course, nobody outside the DUR ever said anything about what we were doing, but everybody knew. They all did. I wish I could tell someone about this, anyone, I really do, but I, I just can't. If I did, if they, if they found out, what the fuck would I do then? Part 4 Yesterday Morning April 29th, 2045. Every weekday morning at 5 a.m., Harvey's alarm would go off. It would trigger the brewing of his powdered coffee machine and start the television monitor that dominated his spacious, luxury apartment on Roosevelt Island. The internal corporate web broadcast was his morning news, a daily dose of renewed propaganda. As we continue to liberate our treasured city from the oppression of the trespasser class, we remember the liberation of Dachau prison camp in Nazi Germany. 100 years ago today, the United States Army liberated the camp after 12 years of Nazi oppression. The news anchor read, 
Harvey looked up to the images of the emaciated people in striped, tattered clothes. He looked at the old films of the tortured prisoners and saw light in their eyes and smiles on their faces. Harvey couldn't understand how anyone could smile after enduring nearly a decade of that. Thirty minutes later, Harvey was steam showered and dressed. He wore a thin compression undergarment with a rubber full body wetsuit zipped over. The sun was nearly rising as Harvey boarded the eight seat orb with his squad of fellow movers. The drone craft lifted from the pad on the roof of the building and then darted down the East River just above the bridge spans. A minute later, his mover squad was offloaded at the DUR station house on Chambers Street. There they joined a team of marshals, the armed combatants who would spearhead the invasion. The reclamation team were briefed on that day's objectives. They were to penetrate and clear a new reclamation zone. It was a large block at Stytown, which included a park which had become a shanty village. Once given their orders, the 80-man team suited up into their tactical gear. Movers, just like the marshals, wore a bulletproof exoskeleton. It was a state-of-the-art full-body armor designed for surviving the hostile reclamation areas. Harvey was not armed with deadly weapons, as he was never intended for combat. The movers were meant to clear non-combatants and see them and their garbage disposed of quickly. Therefore, they were equipped only with other non-lethal methods of human extraction. The attack orbs hovered above the reclamation area, two on each corner of the block. The armed resistance below were already firing their small arms at them. The attack orbs released several drones, which dropped stun and tear gas grenades on the combatants. Explosions rocked the ground below. The martial attack teams then descended towards the ground into the gassy fog of battle with their many robotic attack dogs in tow. Harvey could only observe this action from afar, though he was trained as a Marine to do those sorts of attack maneuvers. He was too old to be a marshal. He was barely young enough to be a mover. The mover orbs were the largest of the fleet, with over a hundred large propellers. The massive trucks they rode contained the petrol cannons that would torch the trash pile. The empty cargo bed was designed to hold the indigents they transported to the courts for processing. The gunfire died down below and the order was given for Harvey's truck to move in. The giant orb descended slowly until it touched down on the center of the shanty village. His squad leader, Harris, got word they were cleared for departure, so Harvey's team got to work. When the gunfire would start, the non-combatants would retreat to their shelters. The first step was to convince them to come out of hiding and leave peacefully. This encampment is in a zone ordered for legal reclamation. You are trespassing. Please come with us. If you cooperate, you will not be harmed. The gentle voice of the pre-recorded announce was broadcast from the tweeter atop his helmet. It repeated. This encampment is in a zone ordered. There was no movement from inside the improvised tent. Please come with us. So Harvey Pull down the filthy towels covering the entrance. Be gone, hound of hell! Yelled an old man. His eyes were ablaze with anger as he charged at Harvey. The elderly priest stumbled as he yelled again. Back to hell with you! He said, casting his fingers towards Harvey's helmeted face. Harvey grabbed the man's wrist with his left hand and raised his right to the man's face. Harvey then activated a discharge of vaporized halothane. It was a powerful dose of sleeping gas sprayed directly into the man's face. Harvey then grasped his frail body to prevent him from falling face first into the ground. Then another man emerged from within the darkened tent and tackled Harvey, 
This man was much younger and stronger. He was able to knock Harvey down. Get your hands off of him. The man then leapt atop him and beat on his helmet with his bare hands. This encampment is a known ordered legal reclamation. One of Harvey's counterparts then shot the young attacker with a high voltage electric wand. Harvey got the man off of him, but his counterpart kept administering the electric shock until the man squealed for mercy. A third person then emerged from the tent. It was a young woman. She looked terrified and confused. Ingram approached her, and before she could ask her question, he subdued her with a spray of halothane. Harvey was moved by how young and beautiful she was. Clearly, she did not belong here. She was out of place. But now, just like all the others, she would be reassessed. The court consisted of a closer who would confirm with an order judge. They would look over any information gathered about the subject for their own records. Few people so assessed would actually be relocated anymore. Relocation had run its course and become far too expensive. There was no longer any profit motive. The order judge would stamp the closer's request and then order the assessed to standby status. The dazed and barely conscious defendants would then be escorted to Pharma, where they would be further drugged, examined, and prepared for final disintegration. They would remove their hair using a depilatory agent. This was done to mitigate the stench of the Zappa chamber's exhaust system. While this speedy trial took place, the movers would be sterilized and their body armor would be cleaned and serviced. They would then change into their civilian uniforms. Upon completing their afternoon meal, they would be debriefed on the mission and the status of the reclamation area. They would then receive their last assignment, escorting their post-judgment standby to sweep A-17. Tomorrow, they would do it all again. What happened to Ingram? Harvey said in a near whisper. Torres looked at him, quite confused, as to why Harvey broke silence when in the hallway with standbys. He did not respond. He was just there, three gurneys behind me. Harvey said a bit louder. Torres glared at him demonstratively, but remained silent. The double doors of suite A-17 opened with an air-pressed mechanical force. The two chamber operators dressed all in white with medical masks over their faces, exited the well-lit doorway. Torres turned to them eagerly to deliver his standby and complete his shift. He was eager to go home. One of the chamber ops placed her digital wand over Torres's delivery pad, which rest atop the standby's chest, confirming the accuracy of the standby's identity prior to final vaporization. Once his standby was officially received, Torres headed home, up the elevator to the roof where the orb back to Roosevelt Island was waiting. The doors to A-17 then closed, and the light of the hallway was once again darkened in waiting. Harvey stepped away from his standby, something he would never do normally. He approached the security stairwell across from where he had last seen Ingram and peered through the door's narrow window. He then used his ID to open the door. As he entered, Harvey saw Ingram with his entire jumpsuit removed, masturbating alongside the beautiful young standby he had been assigned to deliver. The young woman's naked body was exposed, and Ingram had his free hand on her breast. Ingram, what the fuck? Harvey asked. Ingram had a look of terrified embarrassment. He turned his head and raced naked down the stairs. Hey, hey, where are you going? Get back here! Harvey yelled down the staircase at him. Ingram just kept going, down the stairs. His frantic steps echoed through the stairwell. Harvey closed the heavy door to the stairwell. As it click-locked, the young woman was awakened. She sat up in her gurney and realized she was naked. She looked to Harvey, then at the gurney beneath her. She gasped. You want to live? Harvey asked her bluntly. 
she nodded back. Harvey picked up Ingram's jumper uniform and handed it to her. Then put this on and come with me. Part 5 The security door buzzed again, jarring Harvey from his nap. Two closers then entered the room, all business. Hi, Harvey. You go by Harv? The first closer asked rather nicely. Harvey did not respond. My name is Sid Pierce. I'm a relocation officer for DUR. This man to my right is Mr. Gene Davis. He motioned to the angry-looking bad cop that was Pierce's closer partner. Davis looked disinterested in Harvey's greeting. He's also with Relo. I'm the dude who's going to tear you a new asshole if you don't start talking some goddamn sense. Understand? The second closer threatened. Harvey was not impressed. I told Collins everything. You didn't tell anyone anything. Now the truth, motherfucker. Start speaking it. Davis demanded. His angry, wide-eyed gaze did not blink. Pierce tried a gentler approach. Harvey, look. We know about Dahlia. We spoke with Ingram. He told us the whole story. We're not looking to get any of our movers in any trouble, okay? It's not why we're here. We just need to find the girl because... He smiled in a nearly guilty fashion. Well, you know. Harvey was about to offer another denial, but then Davis cut him off. Forget about trouble. You best be thinking, how bad do I want to fucking survive this shit? You feel me? Davis warned. Now, start talking. Tell us, where did you bring the girl? Yesterday evening. Harvey hurried down several flights of the barely lit stairwell. He waved at Dahlia to keep up with him. When they both reached the bottom of the stairwell, Harvey started hailing orbs on his phone. Dahlia approached him with trepidation. She was shaking. Her head weaved uncontrollably from side to side. Dahlia was breathing heavily and then fainted forward, dizzied by hyperventilation. Harvey helped her back up to her feet. It's the after effects of the midazolam. When you break out of the deep sleep and regain consciousness, you get a rush of adrenaline. It causes an irregular heartbeat. Just try to breathe slowly through your nose, okay? You're gonna be all right. Harvey reassured her. What is this place? Where are you taking me? She asked, trying to understand the insignia of the jumpsuit she was given to cover her naked body. Who's Ingram? She pointed to the name on the uniform. She placed her hands upon her head and felt she was completely hairless. Why did you shave me? Listen to me. You're in the corporate offices of the DUR. You've been... You've been convicted of trespassing in a reclamation zone. You were designated as a post-judgment standby. You were about to be put into the zapper with the rest of them. Convicted? By what court? What do you mean, into the zapper? She asked, in disbelief. Look, I want you to escape. I'm not sure why, but I do. And there's only one way out of here. So if you want to take this chance, you'll have to do exactly as I tell you. Understand? Javi asked. Dahlia nodded. When we exit these double doors, there will be three orbs hovering down the street. I'm going to go out ahead of you and jump in the first one. Then I want you to run out. Don't look at anyone, don't talk to anyone. Just keep your head down and run into the third orb. Skip one and enter the next. It will take you to a pre-programmed location. Whatever you do, don't speak, okay? Harvey asked again. Once again, Dahlia nodded. Third orb. I'll meet you on the other side. Harvey then burst through the double doors raced down the marble stairs, and hopped into a waiting, automated orb on the street beneath. The auto orb flew away immediately. Dahlia cracked open and then peered through the large double doors. She then exited the doors with trepidation and then descended the stairs onto Chambers Street. She saw the two orbs 
that were hovering there above the street. She passed the first one, and then reached the other. She tried to regulate her breath, as Harvey had suggested, but her heart was now racing uncontrollably. The door to the third orb then opened, and she got in. The orb then whisked away silently. Harvey had a friend at Orb Corp. Goddard was an intel officer that was stationed at Bagram while Harvey was in country. They went to school together at Hunter College in New York. Goddard was currently a programmer at Orb Corp and had access to some encrypted navigation codes within a select few navi orbs that he could share with friends. These free orb rides could be pre-programmed to go anywhere, even into restricted zones. Harvey was happy to take the codes from Goddard. He had planned on using them when and if he made his final escape from New York, and his escape from Renew. At first, he hoped to hatch a plan to find and recover his daughter Nikki, who was with her mother on Okinawa. But in 2045, to try to cross Corpo state lines was a major endeavor, requiring a lot of credentials. Trying to traverse international borders was next to impossible, and probably insane. Harvey's orb flew a pre-programmed path that no other commercial orb could. The orb darted up the East River and then hovered right over Harvey's DUR residence on Roosevelt Island. He had it programmed to allow him to leap from the air stair that had been deployed right above his exterior patio. Harvey leapt off the orb and then it bolted away, heading north towards the Bronx. Harvey looked to his phone and saw the other orb was on its way. He then looked to each side of his balcony and across the river to Manhattan to see if his illegal entry had been noticed. But there was almost no one outside. The coast appeared to be clear, for now. The second orb then swooped in above him. He moved closer to the patio's sliding glass door as the orb's air stair extended out from the large circular drone. Dahlia looked down the air stairs and saw Harvey waiting below. Jump out, quick, before anyone sees, he instructed. Dahlia had second thoughts. Maybe Harvey was the danger, not where he had taken her from. Maybe she needed to direct this orb back to Manhattan. Who are you? Why have you taken and undressed me? What do you want? Dahlia demanded. Harvey motioned for her to keep it down. He then reached for his phone. Dahlia realized Harvey had the power on that phone to send her away on that orb. She leapt out instinctively. The orb then whisked away to the southeast, towards Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Please, come inside. Harvey let Dahlia inside, and then closed the glass doors behind her. Once again, he reconnoitered from his patio. There were a few people, walking dogs in the cold drizzle of the spring evening, but they were heading away from his place. There was movement on Manhattan, but nothing irregular. Dahlia entered Harvey's apartment and headed immediately to the front doorway. She tried to open the door, but it was locked. She then reached for the deadbolt. It's got a security bolt, Harvey said as he re-entered. He then activated an application on his phone, and the door was unlocked. Dahlia looked back to Harvey and then ripped open the door. She left his apartment and shut the door behind her. She then approached the security elevator and soon realized she would need credentials to engage it. The door to Harvey's place then reopened. Please, come in. We don't have much time, Harvey said softly. I'll tell you everything, but... Harvey motioned to his lips with his finger, suggesting his neighbors should not be alerted to her presence. Dahlia then re-entered Harvey's place. Harvey then closed and relocked his door. He headed to his bedroom. Dahlia followed and saw he was in his closet, opening a wall safe. 
Harvey withdrew his remaining U.S. cash savings, some one-ounce gold bars encased in plastic, and then his digital keys. He then pulled out his holstered Glock pistol and strapped it to his body. He then looked up to Dahlia. Why were you in that restricted area? What the hell are you doing in New York? Harvey asked as he turned and filed through his hangers of clothes, pulling some shirts and pants. He then pulled a small bag and started packing it. I was looking for my mom. She was in Stytown. I grew up here. I was working in London when we lost contact. I came to find her building was condemned by something called D-U-R. Harvey looked up to her and motioned to the D-U-R emblem on the oversized uniform she was wearing. That's who I work for. Or did. I guess I just quit. Harvey said with exasperation. He then opened the second closet, which revealed the clothes of his second ex-wife. They hadn't been moved since she left, over two years ago. Check in here. There might be something that fits you. Harvey offered. Dahlia stepped over to the bureau, which held a rotating digital photo display. She could see images of a mixed-race Asian child. She was very young. You have kids? She asked. I did. He said, sadly. Oh, I'm sorry. She said, assuming the child was deceased. No, no, she lives with her mother in Japan. I I don't see her anymore, just memories now. Harvey said, grabbing the image display, powering it down and then placing it into his duffel bag. Dahlia approached the closet and pulled out a couple of blouses. She frowned as she smelled the nasty chemical odor that consumed her hairless body. What is that awful smell? She asked, motioning to the stench of her skin. It's the theoglycolic acid. They use a depilatory agent on all the standbys for hair removal. Harvey said. Here. He said, opening the door to the bath. He started the shower. But make it quick. We need to move fast. He insisted. Dahlia closed the door behind her and then undressed and entered the shower. She took a lot longer than Harvey would have hoped. She was determined to get the chemical smell off her. Harvey checked his phone. Still no messages. He then exhaled and laid down on his mattress. When Dahlia figured out the shower mechanism and the water stopped, Harvey was awakened from a short catnap. Dahlia exited the bathroom in a towel. She stepped back over to the bed and saw he had placed an undergarment and some pants for her to try on. Dahlia then sat beside Harvey. Is she gone? She asked him. Is who gone? Harvey asked innocently. My mother. What did they do with her? She asked. Her breath accelerated as her eyes filled with tears. I don't know, but... Harvey shook his head. Dahlia cried. He embraced her. For the first time in a very long time, Harvey allowed himself to empathize with the suffering of another human being. He could feel her fear, her longing. Holding her in his arms as she cried ignited a portion of his psyche he had forgotten completely. How do I find her? She said to him. What do I have to do? Who do I talk to? She asked desperately. No one. I'm not here. I I don't know. I mean, if she was there in that zone. Javi shook his head again. Dahlia fell into his embrace, sobbing. What happened to our country? How did this all happen? She asked. Javi had no answer. Dahlia's towel became undone, and her full breasts became visible. Javi's eyes gravitated to them naturally. She did not move. She did not cover herself. You can touch me if you want. 
she said softly. Javi's face then descended to Dahlia's breast without hesitation. His mouth took in her left nipple. Dahlia exhaled with pleasure. In that moment, Javi felt what it meant to be human again, what it meant to be a man that was inspired by love, not by hate. As he gorged on her breast with his mouth, he became fully erect. His heart was beating once again with purpose. The blood coursed through his veins, not out of exertion, but pure stimulation. Just then, his phone broadcast an emergency signal. It was emergency code seven, a breach of DUR personnel. His lips then left hold of Dahlia's breast. You need to go, now, Javi said. What's going on? Dahlia asked, recovering herself in her towel. Get dressed, they're coming, Javi said, as he read the emergency message on his phone. Security breach, acknowledge your coordinates. Do not move, the message read. You need to get out of here, he said. Who's coming? What do you mean? Where? Where do we go? She asked. Javi had a saddened look of defeat upon his face. I can't come with you. If I go, we'll both get caught. You need to go alone. He said. Go? Where? Dahlia asked. Harvey motioned for her to be silent as he received the incoming call from DUR headquarters. This is Mankin. He said into the phone. Harvey, where the fuck are you? Asked his commanding officer. I'm home on Roosevelt. Why? What, what's going on? Javi asked, innocently. Part six. So here's the problem that we have, Harv. Said Pierce. Here's the big fucking problem we have. Said Davis, with his arms folded, his gaze unflinching. Our security details at Roosevelt have sent us some of their findings. Pierce added. He was going to show Harvey his digipad, but could see he wasn't interested in looking at it. We've discovered some troubling data in video. Very fucking troubling data and video, added Davis. According to their secure intraweb, the front door of your unit 11J at Roosevelt 199 was unlocked from within by you at 171527. And the security camera caught this image of a young black woman exiting your door. He motioned for Harvey's attention to the video still of Dahlia as she first fled his apartment and attempted to escape towards the elevator. The woman later returns to your apartment where she's wearing a DUR jumpsuit. It looks like Ingram's, which incidentally was missing from where he claimed to have left it in stairwell 11. She's hairless, just like a post-judgment standby. I don't know, Mr. Davis. Who would you say that woman resembles? Hmm, I'd say that bitch is a dead ringer for one Dahlia fucking Preston. Yeah, I agree. Are you ready to start telling us what we need to know, Harv? I've never seen that woman. I don't know what you guys are fucking talking about. Javi continued to deny them. Oh, so you got a whole stable of hairless black bitches up there in your crib, huh? Davis taunted. Javi did not answer. Hey, look, Harv. We get it. It's a stressful job. You get lonely. Saw something you liked. We understand. But look, we got a job to do here. That girl is a post-judgment standby. We need to locate her, or there will be... consequences. Where'd you hide that pussy at, man, kid? Time to spill the beans, my man. Unless you want to be charged for obstructing a missing PJS investigation. That won't end well, I can assure you. Davis threatened. Last night. Dahlia found a denim skirt that fit her surprisingly well. The white blouse she picked was a little small for her bust, but she found a buttoned beige sweater that could hide her chest from any unwanted attention. There was a pair of Nike running shoes that were tight, but not too small for her feet when left unlaced. Before she left the bedroom to find Harvey, she grasped a red cloche hat 
that she used to cover her hairless head. She then exited the bedroom to see Harvey still on the phone with the DUR. He motioned with his hand not to speak. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I understand. I'll, I'll get myself dressed. I'll be right down. Harvey answered solemnly into his phone. He then hung up with headquarters and started using another orb code immediately after to hail one last specific ride. Who is that? Dahlia asked. They're coming to pick me up. You have to get out of here now. Harvey warned. Dahlia was frightened. Where? Where can I go? New Canaan, Connecticut. Harvey said, pointing to the navigational map on his phone. There's another orb coming in the next minute. It will take you there directly. There's a golf course up in the woods, sort of an old waspy social hall. It's called the Kenneth Lang Country Club. The orb will take you there. You can find this address from there. Harvey then handed Dahlia all of his cash and gold he had collected from his safe. He then took off his chest holster and handed her his Glock. Take this. Why? Aren't you coming with me? No, I, I don't want this. I, I don't want a gun. She protested as he started strapping it onto her. Just take it. Just in case. Harvey fastened the holster to her body and then helped her hide it underneath her sweater. There's a man by the name of Colonel Charles Anderson. He was my commanding officer in Bagram. And he lives in a house across the street from the country club. I wrote down the address, 117 Gun Hill Road, Givness. Harvey said, handing her a handwritten note. He will help you find your answers. Me, I'm, I'm done. Harvey said sadly, shaking his head again. Wait, what? How can I? Dahlia was quite vexed. An orb then swooped in above his patio. He opened the sliding glass door, and the air stairs extended from the craft. Take it. Go now. Harvey demanded, pointing to the waiting orb. She left him reluctantly, with little assurances given, and no more asked. Soon after, her orb darted up the East River, and then to the north. The DUR orb arrived on his rooftop. Harvey boarded the corporate craft alone with little hope of a future. Part 7 Pierce and Davis marched back to the interrogation room swiftly and with purpose. Davis had the large list of charges of his indictment already pre-trial approved. These grave offenses to the body corporate included interference with a PJS investigation, obstruction of corporate process, failure to obey orders, desertion of a critical post, failure to complete delivery of an assigned PJS, unauthorized movement and removal of the PJS. The list went on. When the door thrust open that final time, Harvey could see his closers had come to close the book on him. Harvey Mankin. You are under arrest for critical violation of Renew's corporate bylaws and codes of conduct. Davis said angrily. Harvey could see two additional security guards and Monica from Pharma in the doorway, standing behind the two closers. What is this? You can't... I haven't done anything wrong. Harvey made one last protest before the two hulking security men charged I haven't done and then anything. grappled. I haven't done anything wrong. Harvey kicked at the wall, attempting to break free of their grip. But these guards were well-trained and experienced in the methods of restraining a man, even one of Harvey's size and strength. Monica was able to administer the shot much more quickly than normal and without any of her typical complaints. After a couple of minutes, Harvey was thoroughly sedated and completely under their control. They dragged him up to suite C-11 where he was brought before the renewed corporate magistrate, who quickly reviewed his file and the charges. Harvey was standing throughout the sham trial. He was nearly unconscious. Davis was holding him up while Pierce read the corporate complaint to the judge. He couldn't make out much of what was being said. But when the gavel was struck, Harvey Mankin was no longer a mover. He had become a post-judgment standby. 
Harvey was then strapped to a gurney where another, heavier cocktail of drugs was injected into him. His eyes were then covered and a breathing apparatus was inserted into his mouth. He was then wheeled into a small chamber where his body was showered with hair removing chemicals. He was then turned over to McGeehan, who was stunned to see his comrade in arms joining the rest of the day's deliveries to suite A-17. As the double doors to the disintegration chamber were opened and his identification and judgment status were verified, the midazolam began to wear off. Harvey knew where he was. He couldn't move, but he knew that he was about to go into the zapper. There was a loud alarm that announced the readying of the chamber. He could hear the inner shield wall close in around him as the electric chargers powered up for the latest engagement. Harvey thought one last time of who he was. He thought of his mother, of being there when she passed. He thought of his daughter and how she would likely never know what came of him. There was a flash of light and it was over. All these anxious days we spend trying to make things right, we clean up the constant mess that is our lives, trying to right what we perceive wrong, fix our mistakes and expunge from existence, all the things we wish we could remove from sight. But in the end, it is we that are made to vanish. Everything we thought we are. And it is only here, in this place, where we are nothing, that we truly find that cleanliness and perfection we seek. Here there is no want, no hate, no love or regret. What I was is now gone, but my spirit has finally found contentment. There is no I. There is no want or need to win or any fear of failure. For here, everything that was lost is found. Everything that could be wanted is gained. Here there is only being. It is peace. End. Thanks so much for watching everyone. Please remember to subscribe to my channel and ring the notification bell so you never miss a new episode. Also be sure to hit the like button if you want to see more of this type of original full cast audio drama. Comment below, it helps a lot. I'd love to hear what you think about this brand new original feature. I've shared the cast information in the video description. Be sure to check out my incredible cast. Show them some love on those social medias. I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity to work with all of them. Sharing this free video is as simple as clicking the share button to alert your social friends about this story. On my channel, it's always here, free to listen to, commercial free on YouTube.